I'm Ann Abernathy, and this is Beyond Badass, How Fierce Women Get It Done. As a real estate broker here in Aspen, Colorado, I've had the good fortune to meet so many impressive and inspiring women, and I just thought their stories should be heard. The goal here is for all of us to learn together. Welcome to Beyond Badass, the podcast. I've got a great guest today, but before we get to that, if you're thinking about selling your house and you want to be really badass about it, where do you begin? How about right here? This is today's Fast Fix. Today's Fast Fix is Corral the Critters. Now I know we all love our dogs and cats, right? We like all our pets, but not everybody does. And they don't really want to enjoy my little Abby's toys here, they're really stinky and they're all over the house. So grab all the toys and put them in one single box, put them in a closet and get them away. That includes litter boxes too. Oh my gosh, get rid of the litter boxes. And when the showing starts, those pets need to go with you when you leave the house for the showing. That's today's Fast Fix. My guest today is beyond badass. She's a world-class veterinary surgeon, but she's done so much more. It's not like she just goes in and operates on dogs and walks out. You will not believe all the things that one person can do with one degree as a doctor. It's pretty amazing. Janet Van Dyke is here, and she's going to share all her information about her institute, which is an educational institute, and she is also... Uh, a diplomat with the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation, everything. I mean, I, you've got so many letters, I can't keep up. What, I'm, I'm way behind a lot of my friends with the letter collection. I don't, well, how many letters are there? You've well, got there, that's a DMV, few. DVM, WDVM. Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, right. that's, a, that's a basic. And then the rest is just board certification in sports medicine and rehabilitation, which is a field that really just started 20 years ago. Well, but weren't you instrumental in starting that field? I kind of helped, yeah. Well, yeah. come on, Janet. There were some people getting rolling in it, um, and I, I saw, I was lucky enough to have clients who were physical therapists who would bring their dogs to me for surgery, and I would try to send them home with the usual instructions that we as veterinarians had learned, you know, move their legs like he's riding a bike. And the People would say to me, you know, with all due respect, he wasn't any good at riding a bike before I brought him to the <laughs> surgery. I have no intention of him doing that going forward. As a physical therapist, if this was my child, this is the motion I would do. And I started to realize, why are we not incorporating what fits so well in the human physical therapy world? Why don't we bring that to our dogs? We do these elaborate surgeries and then lock them in a cage or, that- do, you know, things that are counterintuitive. Yeah, that doesn't make much sense. Right. But it's so new. It's So it's new. I mean, it, it really is the last 20 years that it's been rolling. And um, it started It was in, in Europe. They were starting to look at this earlier. It really got started in the equestrian field. People who ride horses, mm. you know, if, if your dog's lame, you can still take him for a walk. If your horse is lame, your relationship is shot for the day. Right. So horse people tend to be a little more proactive in, bring me something that will get my horse better. So we started to see this going on in Europe with the equestrian field and then said, if it works on a horse, it'll certainly work on a dog. Let's bring it over and and do it here. So it's been an evolving science. But you were an equestrian, right? I did a lot of riding when I was younger, and that made me very aware of this issue of, of lameness and the need to have your partner able to do your sport with you. Um, And so that's where, as I got into doing surgery, I really liked the sports medicine side of it. The dogs who are competing or who have a job, dogs who are out herding and working, Uh or the military dogs, dogs that have a real job to do, and how do I get him back to doing his job effectively and efficiently? There's got to be a huge demand for that. So there is. I mean, the, there's a huge demand on the military side. Right. Um, and, you know, TSA dogs, the sniffer dogs that you see at the mm-hmm. airports. But also, people are becoming really involved, highly involved in canine sports for fun. So they do agility, uh, you know, or they have to go over obstacle courses mm-hmm. and, and, you know, other, other sports like that. But they're competitive sports for dogs. They're highly competitive. People spend a fortune going through the training and I getting no the idea. gear. And then competing 
within their state and then internationally. There's, there's world agility championships that people aspire to, you know. And it's, so they, those are people who are now saying, I need to find someone who understands veterinary sports medicine and can keep my dog at peak performance. So as any doctor, as, as you say, you practice medicine, right? Mm-hmm. You practice your specialty. Right. So as you have practiced this and integrated it, all the, the PT and even acupuncture, right? Right. You've even, right. All the things that we think that go with physical therapy, what have you learned and improved on? Well, we've really learned that the, the temptation is to think I can buy equipment that will do magic things for me. When in reality, what we have to do is look at the human physical therapy model and say, why are they so successful? Why is it that your highly trained, very successful orthopedic surgeon mm-hmm. says to you, you need to go see a physical therapist instead of me or after I'm done? Right. right? And it's not because that physical therapist has an underwater treadmill or a laser or some other piece of equipment. What they have is incredibly trained hands. And that's what we as veterinarians now bringing physical therapists into the field with us are recognizing is that the key is training their hands, our hands, to be better diagnostically, being able to find things and determine this is where the pain is coming from. You know, it, in the human field, if you were to go see your orthopedic surgeon and say, I'm having, I don't know, my shoulder isn't, ha- isn't happy, they'll evaluate, they may have you do some imaging, mm-hmm. but then they're going to say, go see a physical therapist. Right. Chances are good the physical therapist is going to say, yeah, it's near your shoulder, but it's actually your neck that's a problem. You know, they go and do their own diagnostics and improve on the answer of here's where, let's tease out the exact tissue that's the problem and address that rather than the shotgun approach of take some ibuprofen, mm-hmm. rest it for two weeks, and then let's see if it has right. gets better. Or, yeah. or, or operate. Or right, pet. yeah, let me, let me take a look inside there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, as someone whose husband has had nine orthopedic surgeries, yes. I can tell you it's all about the PT. Yeah. And, and a, a lady that I interviewed just before you today just had her knee done, and she goes to the same physical therapist, and I'm telling you, if that physical therapist leaves town, I think there'll be just a parade behind her because Absolutely. she is the one who's put all these people back together in our very active sports-minded community right. as humans. Right. But I can imagine with your dog. So people are, I mean, the dog world is its own universe. Yes. Dog lovers are... And I am one, and, I, you know, we've got our little Abby, and we just adore her. I have never seen such commitment to, to pets, particularly during COVID. Yeah. I mean, they were, yeah. they were companion pets, and people will, I guess, spend anything, and they want every resource, right? right? Exactly. It gave a lot of people the opportunity to recognize, my dog is lame, you know? So during COVID, uh. we had a lot more people coming in and saying, I just realized the dog isn't quite right. You know, normally I'm out of the house 10 hours. I take her for a walk in the morning. I take her for a walk at night. Now they're with them all day and recognizing she's really giving me clear signs that there's something not not great going on here. And it gave more people the opportunity to come in and recognize with some physical therapy, some rehabilitation, we can get these kids back. You know, a lot of the older dogs where people say, you can't get up the stairs anymore. And we say, you know, give us a little chance here. Because really? grandma couldn't get up the stairs either if she didn't get, get some physical right. therapy on a regular basis. So, and, and so that's a, we talk about the sports people a lot. But I think the, the most beautiful part of this field is the geriatrics. And mm. getting people the chance to give their dog a whole new lease on life, literally. The, just the ability to get up and move around better. And it's, it's using techniques that are, very simple, non-invasive to the dog, but gives it this ability to say, I can get on the bed again. Oh, you know, I yeah. I can do it, right? So I, this is what I find so funny. Just as we sat down, we were talking about a, a camping thing that you were planning that got canceled for a variety of reasons, and you were saying that you were having trouble with your cat. And I know that you're very attached to your cat, and you are the dog doctor. Yeah. So why don't you have a dog? You know, because I travel... So much. During COVID, less so, which is why I went to the shelter to bring home a cat. I was oh. just going to foster her. 
Oh. And I'm a classic, what they call foster failure. <laughs> you, you go to get your foster animal that you think, I'll just dust it up and make it a more adoptable animal and I'll give it back to the shelter. Uh-huh. Mm-mm. You know, it's, it's with you full time then. So a cat is a little bit more travel friendly than sure. the kind of dogs that I would tend to have in my house. Um, Which would be? Probably, you know, big sporting dogs, mm. right? Um, and so the cat allows me to be, she goes in the car with me. She can fit under a plane seat. And so now she's my travel bud. But in the past, in the 20 years leading up to this, I would be on the road probably 300 nights a year. That's, how do you do that with a dog? You can't do that. Not with a big dog, you know? And it's not fair to the dog to say, I'll see you for those 60 mm, nights. No. And that you'll have dog sitters the rest of the time. So we need to get into the part that takes you away 360 or four, 340 days a year, which is even more remarkable. It's one thing to be a doctor to be highly trained and be a veterinarian who's seeing all these. And it's another thing to just go, okay, I'm going to go create an entire school, kind of a college, it's a little bit, I can, training. I can explain it, yes. You explain it. Tell us what that is. So it, it started um, in about 2000 when I recognized what I was doing was taking these techniques that the physical therapist had taught me, and then mm-hmm. I'd gone to physical therapy programming to learn more about the manual skills and whatnot. And what I was doing was going into practices. I had a mobile surgical practice. So I would take my instruments, my computer, my nurse, and we'd go into practices to do the procedures that they otherwise would have to ship out to a big referral center or to the veterinary schools. And I was going in, and what I was doing was training their team how to manage this case preoperatively and postoperatively and how to do the rehabilitation. And it didn't take too long for me to recognize this is a really inefficient system for me to take one team at a time and train them. Right. Right. So I started thinking I should put a bunch of my client veterinarians together and train them at one time. So that was the, the seed that got planted was... How do I put a group of veterinarians together and help them learn how to do this mm-hmm. technique, these techniques? And so I thought about it, and then I thought, you know, I'm also kind of at a point where I was going to wean myself out of doing the surgery. I would still do the orthopedic consultations, but I wanted a teaching gig. I wanted something like where I could teach the stuff that I'd learned. And so I thought I'll just find a simple little job someplace, teaching anatomy and surgical approaches <laughs> and whatnot. And it... It, the more I looked at it, the more I thought, I think I need to do this myself. So I started looking for people who I had seen on the podium lecturing at meetings who were really dynamic, really good at it, and who also understood this rehabilitation piece. And I said, can you, if I, put, if I start working on this, can you join me? And everybody I called was like, sure, that sounds fabulous. I, if you're doing it, I'll do it. Tell me when we start. And so in the course of a, about a year... We put together our entire curriculum and started offering sort of beta testing small groups mm-hmm. to see how would it work, and it just took off. Is so, it in person all the all the time, or do you do online, or do you record them? How, how, what's we, the technique? Yeah, but because it's manual techniques, the temptation is to say let's do it all remotely, right. especially in the last you know the COVID year. But um, you, you can't. You have to have your hands on someone else's hands, just like teaching surgery. You have to know whether they're doing it appropriately and give them the feedback so we do mostly in person but we have moved a lot of our lecture material the purely didactic lecture material to online to minimize how much time people have to be out of pocket to get the training that makes sense it allows them to be with us for four days instead of six and they're going to spend maybe 18 hours online doing the pre-course work Um, it's not ideal i really prefer the in-person because I think even a lecture, there are things that it's easy to glaze over when you're watching online, mm-hmm. but um, we've been honing those lectures and the, the video techniques and making them more interactive so that our, our platform that people go to to do their online work is is very stimulating and very interactive, so they don't feel like... Mm, oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, I mean, it's a huge project that you launched. It's been a big, I mean, the the COVID thing certainly turned us from work that we had started pondering and saying, you know, it'd be really great to have a better online uh, position and a platform and to be able to move more of this material. But 
oh, I'm so busy teaching and we're so busy moving from country to country. We don't have time to do it. And all of a sudden, you had the gates closed and we had nothing but time and said, this, let, this is our opportunity to create this hybrid model that we had wanted to have for some time. And what do you have? What came of it? What, what were the unexpected things that came of it? The unexpected was um, seeing just how good my faculty members are. How many are in there? In front of a camera. We have a total of 27. There's a core of about eight of us that do the majority. But we have specialists that come in and talk about nutrition, you know, that are boarded mm-hmm. nutritionists. And um, people who talk about uh, pathology and about other avenues and other neurology and neurosurgery and bits that are important but adjuncts to the core curriculum. And aren't you bringing them all into Aspen for some a special conference or something? So or were you going to? That's or? a little different. That's the Veterinary Orthopedic okay. Society. And that's a, a, a group of all the orthopedic surgeons around the world who uh, gather once a year, and we always do it at a ski place. So it's the Veterinary Orthopedic Society, VOS, which is also Vets on Skis. And so we go to a <laughs> ski resort every year and spend seven days doing aggressive lecturing, morning and evening, but from 9.30 till about 3.30, you're outdoors. That's fantastic. You're out testing your sports medicine. Te- go test it. Make sure that you can you can do whatever you've learned on yourself. But, I mean, so you, you're doing that in your spare time, right? That's, that's, that. a, that's my, it's my side passion. It was my career. You know, it, oh. I, I was doing orthopedics. Right, right, and, right. And so that, and it. It's such a great organization. You know, you know, sometimes you'll be on boards or committees or volunteer work, and it's, mm. it's a lot of work. And then there's others where it's, the group is so rewarding to be with, and that's true with this one. I, I adore it. So I was supposed to be off the board last year, and then they said, well, we're coming to Snowmass to do the, the big meeting, so can you help us just with logistics? Next thing I knew, I was like, all right, I'll, yeah, I'll just, I'm in yeah. again. I'll just stay on board for a year. But it's, it's such a delightful. It, the focus of the group is to get young surgeons to get their research done, to get their experience, to get their training, fund things that allows them to come to meetings like this so that they can interact and network and become part of our community. It's fantastic. And the beauty of it is we're graduating 90% women now. So in a oh, field, I know that. In a field, yeah, veterinary medicine is going to the girls, badass girls. And with the surgeons, the orthopedic piece, you know, if you look at human, the human Mm -hmm. side, it's pretty unusual to see a female orthopedic surgeon. Yes. You know, but now we got 90% girls coming in and a big part of my relationship with Veterinary Orthopedic Society has been to help empower the young women and get them not to be afraid to present their research. Because when you stand up and you look and all the, the board and the senior surgeons it's a bunch of men, and they're men who wrote the textbooks. I mean, you recognize them. They're, they're your heroes, and it's very frightening to present. Well, in it's intimidating. Yeah, yeah. So my goal is to stand up and say to them, as the past president of this organization, I'm a girl. You can do this. Yeah. You know, you can do this. Wow. Yeah. And they're responding. Obviously, they're responding. They're responding. I mean, there's some amazing uh, young women and some amazing. I also, though, have four women ahead of me as presidents of this organization who are my role models. They are the picture of badass that did this before we had such a large cohort of women to choose from. You know? So they were the trailblazers, they were really. The trailblazers. So yeah. what is it about, what drew you to this? This Not just the, the orthopedic side or the, the rehab and the integrated medicine part of it, but what drew you to be a vet to start with? Uh, well... I come from a rather short family, and I was riding horses and assumed I, too, would be challenged in height (laughs) and thought at the time when I was really riding a lot, female jockeys were just starting to break into the market and do well. And so I thought, that's it. I'm going to be a jockey. This is going to be great. And by the seventh grade, I was five foot six, and I realized even the most talented jockeys who, who can afford to have a little extra weight are not five foot six. No. And I could I didn't see myself being able to maintain a body weight under about a hundred and ten pounds. Well, no. So I realized can't be a jockey. Who else is at the barn? Who else is there taking <laughs> care of the horses? And it was the vet. So I thought that's what I'll do. And that's a not uncommon route for women to enter veterinary practice is because you loved horses. Right. And dreamed of being with horses and want to practice on horses. 
When I graduated in 1981, it was a steel ceiling for someone wanting to do equine practice as a woman. And I already had this passion. I realized there was something about the shiny instruments. I loved orthopedics. Equine orthopedics is a really tough field. I mean, that it does require a little brawn, and it does mm-hmm. require clients that are willing to go that route with you. And in 1981, that wasn't going to happen. Wow. And so I saw that, and I realized, all right, I'll let the boys do the equine. I looked over, and I thought, you can do some pretty cool orthopedics on dogs. I'll become a dog surgeon, and I'll ride for fun. I mean, how about it? What's better? Yeah. Then 20 years later, I realized, I don't have time to ride. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't been riding. But it's... It's always out there as the goal to get back. Would you do that? Yeah, you have yeah. to mm-hmm. keep that in in the loop, right? Yeah, what kind of what what did you what discipline? So I uh, I did eventing as a kid, and so that's a three day. It's like a mm-hmm. triathlon, right? Um, and loved it, and would continue to do it. But as I got older, it, this happens to all of us. You start sensing I don't know if I should put a third stride in before that jump, and your horse starts thinking. If you're concerned about this, I'm, I'm really concerned yeah, about well, it. I'm sensing this is not a good moment. For right. You. And so you start having those little stutter things and, you know, you miss fences or stop and, you know, and I, and also your brain starts to think, if I do hit that fence incorrectly, what's going to happen? That's going to leave a big mark and it's going to take a long time to get better. Yeah. Whereas a kid, you just throw your heart over it. You know, sure. You don't even think, oh no, kids are, invent- of course. Yeah. Well, you've kind of done, you've, you've launched yourself into the dog thing, but also you kind of replaced that horse thing with hiking. I mean, my goodness, woman, you have hiked the world. I've enjoyed hiking the world with one of your good friends. Yes, I know your good friends. Yes, um, but I, yeah, I love hiking. But you did Kilimanjaro. Did, did, really, you, did you do it twice? Doing it next year. You're doing it again. COVID pushed us back. I've got nine more people who are saying, I want to go do it. Bad-ass, now bad-ass tell me, women. They, I'll say they're bad. What is it, 22,000 feet? Not, no, 19.5, or 50. But you, you clearly thought it was worth it. Oh, absolutely. And it why? Is, it, um, it's not technical. It, you don't have a helmet and ice picks and all the other right. stuff that, you know, that makes it look life-threatening to your mother mm-hmm. when you say you're going to go do it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, so it's a really durable, a long hike. And yeah. And, and done correctly, it's a beautiful experience of reaching altitudes you've never been to before. You know, the first day that we got to the height where Janet and I realized we've never been this high before. Yeah. And, and, the, and you realize, I can do this, but tomorrow we got to go higher. And the next day you just get incrementally a little bit better. We did it in a way that I think is really bright for anybody that is not a crazy mountain climber and that is do it slowly and do it over more days there are people who want to go in and save some money and do a four-day hike right it's it you're you're risking having the issues that the altitude issues that oh i would much better to take the extra days do it gradually and it was you know it's it's a a wonderful team building thing you know we and we did it as a little bit of a fundraiser for a special needs school so we had this little stuffed dog that came along with us who was part of the the team. Oh, that's fun. And that got all of the the guides and the the um, the guys who carry the gear, the porters. They all got in, into it, it. They all understood, and so that became uh, you know another reason that the trip was so exciting. How fun! Yeah. How exciting is that? Yeah. Uh, well, and Janet, you you've had listen, I, and I ask everybody the same thing about failures. Yeah. Have you? Hey, what failures have you had, and have you learned from them? And if so, what? You know, I, I've I've had some. I'm not going to say epic failures. I've had, um, probably I've been fortunate enough to have the realization that that's not a good idea. <laughs> and so it's things where you've had to sort of restart the game plan. Right. But, um, you know, you know, like I say, I've, I've been, I've been blessed. Um, I've had some tragedies in my life, but not things that, um, where I've felt like, oh, I stepped in the yogurt horribly. I mean, I've, we all have. We've all had our moments where you think, "I wish I could take that back," but career-wise, I have, you, I've dodged that bullet pretty well. Well, I mean, you're quite capable of doing that. But the the thing that would not be certainly not be in the category of failure, but would be a challenge, would be that your husband died. Right. And that was 
that was something that, interestingly enough, as close as you were and as much as you loved and enjoyed him, you even turned that into a really positive thing right. a, in a couple of ways, right? Yeah, I mean, being able to talk to other women who, who are experiencing loss or have just experienced loss and helping them recognize the ability to move forward. But, you That's got to be tough. It, it, it is tough, and it's tough to... It's tough to no, no two of us experience this the same, you know. Um, but I had I had 25 years of bliss, and I was just talking about that with a friend this morning. Many yeah. people can't string together 25 years in their life of blissful relationships, right? And we were just absolutely simpatico, and 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 so being able to have that, and then we have three granddaughters who were old enough when he passed to recognize the. The, the exquisite character that he had. And so now to be able to be with them and to sort of bring their relationships forward, mirroring his mindset is great. Um, the other thing that is that was key is his involvement in the Bahamas in a, right. in a very um, delightful little school that he helped to get rolling and was instrumental in doing fundraising for, for special needs kids, in an Fantastic. island country that had no other resources, you know. And you've continued that. Oh, yeah, we continue it. We've had, you know, a hurricane a couple of years ago that set us back, but um, we continue to, to, to really get these kids. And, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal to watch, and I will say the people who have done yeoman duty are, are friends in the Bahamas who had a son who was, had Down syndrome, and they said, what are we going to do? They right. did the homework and really helped launch with another gal this school but through grit and determination to the point of jumping into the the dumps on the main island to pull license plates off wrecked cars. Oh, my goodness. They clean them up and sell them to tourists who like to have a, bah- a Bahamian license plate on their Jeep, mm-hmm. you know. Um, fundraisers of all sorts, anything we could do to get this little school started and the outpouring from people who have then been able to visit it and recognize what a great program it is. Yeah. And to see the success, the kids who have... You know, any disability can go to this little school. And some parents have recognized, my child's being bullied. Oh, that's right. That's his disability. That's right. Can he come to your school? Oh, wow. Sure. And so then you have, you know, we have kids everywhere from, you know, serious disabilities with um, uh, brain injuries and that sort of thing Mm -hmm. to kids who are just dyslexic. Maybe we've, we've had some who are Haitian who... English is a second language mm-hmm. and, and maybe dyslexic, and they are able to come in, and the school is such a nurturing environment that they flourish. We take them all the way through high school graduation. We do, oh. you know, helping them find jobs, and um, it's, it's, it's been just fantastic. So rewarding. So rewarding. Well, yeah. what a, a great legacy that Bruce left, yeah. and, and it's wonderful that you've passed this along. But I, I, you know, you said you had 25 blissful years, and I'm sure all the women and the, the wives in the audience would like to say, well, what's, what's the secret what's the sauce secret? to that? Because you had a rule. Yeah, well, so we, yeah, we had both had some time before we got married. You know, we'd, we'd, we'd been right. adults for a bit before we got married. And we recognized early on, he traveled quite a bit on business, and I was traveling all the time. But it came to our realization that, oh my gosh, if we're not careful, we could be apart for a month at a time. If, right. You know, and so we started to say, let's set a rule that we'll only be apart 21 days in a row. Well, that's a lot, three weeks. Yeah, but, you know, that's our max. And so if it's day 20, whoever didn't, whoever ha- didn't travel the last time has to travel this time to be with the other one, right? So Very we, good. So we had a little rule there. But then after being together quite a bit, and, you know, he too had some orthopedic surgeries, so I would be with him for a few weeks post-op going mm-hmm. through recoveries. We decided it was really smart to limit our time together to 14 days. So we could only be together 14, and then somebody had to hit the road for a little oh, bit. Oh, wow. See, I, that sounds perfect. It was blissful. I mean, we would kiddingly, we'd be like, uh, it's been 13 days. Aren't you going somewhere? <laughs> and, and off we would go. But it made for, you know, that absence makes a heart grow fonder piece. But we both had, the other thing that I think was the key, that, that's sort of a fun thing that we did of watching our calendars. But the key was we both had such intense respect for one another's mm. skill sets. Mm. And I knew I had my foibles and 
I would point his out to him once in a while. But we both re respected each other so much that when a difference of opinion came up, it never turned into a, a cat fight. It never, we, we never raised our voices. We, I never had an opportunity to. We would just look at each other and go, seriously, that's what you think? Explain it. And we'd talk our way through it, and sometimes we'd just agree to disagree on a subject, but we, we, just, we had a, a wonderful ability to work through. That is a gift. It was a gift, and in large part because he was such a kind and generous soul. Well, that, you were pretty kind approach. and generous, too, after he died, the way that you honored his life and the way you scattered ashes on what seven continents or something like that what was it it was he had a list of 10 places that he that he kiddingly maintained it started on a hike here where we got to the top of buckskin pass and he was exhausted and he said to me the next time we're up here together it's going to be you bringing my ashes up here ah! because the view is spectacular and i think this would be a great place to spend the eternity but i'm i'm not hiking it again so I was like, all right, I'm going to keep a list. So then he started the list, and he, he had a list of 10 places that he thought were important moments in his life, you know, yeah. thing, and, and favorite places. And as we would travel, he would get to a place, and he'd go, oh, wait a minute. Take, this Take the Normandy beaches off. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be in Botswana. Yeah. And so he, he had this list, and it, it, it was his sort of a serious joke on his part that he would maintain it and edit it and point it out to people. And then when he died suddenly and unexpectedly, and the next day I thought, I have my marching orders. Yes, you I, do. I know, I know where to go and what to do. And I've informed my granddaughters that I intend to be in those same places. So we're going to GPS mark them, and you girls are going to have to stay in shape because a lot of them involve a lot of hiking. A lot hiking. of hiking. Yeah. Well, you know what? How great is that? Yeah, I, I mean to pass it along to them and and charge them with the responsibility of not only doing it. Somebody's got to get me up there. You're going to have to stay in shape to do it. I think that's just fantastic <laughs> that they do that. But what a clever, clever idea and connection, and it, yeah. it had to be therapeutic for you as well. Absolutely, and it got me to connect with friends who came with me on the various journeys to the different locations to um, honor him and honor him in their own way. At each place. And, and by going through that process, was, it, was that complete? At the end of it, you were, you were healed of the grief over a period of time? It, it made a big difference. I, I managed to get to all 10 places in about a year. And there's still a bit that travels with me everywhere. So he goes with me everywhere. But, um, yeah, it, it made me realize, each place made me realize how much adventure he had taken me on and how my life had changed because of his willingness to explore like this. Things that I had wanted to do, he was able to help me do. And so each place was you know, just loaded with great memories. So how are you doing now? I'm doing well now. With, yeah. all, with all you have going on, and, and what's your next big, except for Kilimanjaro, I started to say, what's your next mountain to climb? But we, <laughs> but we know what that is. You know, I think the next... Um, mountain for me is um, is transitioning my business to adopting my child to someone else, um, and that's a you know I, to sell the business to sell it yeah and it, and that's that's going to take some time you know that is um, it it is my child I've raised it for twenty years and um, it has to be in the right hands and I see myself very gradually transitioning out of being the mom um, but I think that's that's probably my my next big step. And then what will you do? I will be back in the saddle a lot more than I have been in the last 25 years. I'll bet you will. Yeah. And what do we, I, I ask everybody kind of a question like this about what quote, do you have a quote that you love? I have a quote that I love, and it came from my mom. Oh. And it's too bad that she's not here any longer because she would be the headliner in your Beyond Badass program. You know, I've heard stories about your mom, and I, I know that she was a, a force of nature. She was a force of nature. She was a woman ahead of her time who watched her mother divorce her father in the 1940s. Oh, wow. Yeah, and who said this is, you know, this is what it's going to take to be a success and to come from the other side of the tracks, and I'm going to make sure my kids get the best education, and I'm going to make sure my kids, no matter what, think that they're a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. Oh, my gosh. She, every day, convinced me, you're not just the smartest girl in the class, you're the prettiest girl in the class. Oh. And I would look in the mirror and think, 
she has got to be kidding. But I would go off and think, all right, well, my mom said I'm a 10, right? So she was that driving force. She was the one who said when I was finishing veterinary school and someone said you should pursue an internship in New York City, and I thought, are you kidding? And my mom said, of course you're going to do that. Of course you you're I'm sure she was scared to death, but she sent me out the door with that. You've got the force, right? So her, her statement that she would say to me and frequently remind me, sometimes she would just use the first little bit of it, was, if you're acting like a sheep, don't blame the shepherd. Lions can't be herded. Wake up and roar. Oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah. Profound. Yeah. That's her. She, she coined that. So what's the short part? She would just say, you're acting like a sheep, darling. Oh. And that would make me realize, okay, if I'm complaining about how someone's treating me, right. how my job is, you know, this, people aren't doing this. And she would say, you know, don't blame the shepherd. You're the one who has control over how you react to this situation. Be the lion. Wake up, roar. Go do it. Go do it. Yeah. Just yeah. get on with don't it. Don't let yourself be pushed around. Oh right. my gosh, I love her. She You're great? right. She's beyond badass, just like Dr. Janet Van Dyke. <laughs> this is fantastic. Thank you for doing this today. Thank you, Anne. I know your time is precious because you've got you have hikes to do. We do have some hikes to do. You have some hikes to do, but I just am grateful that you came and I love everything you've done. You've reinvented yourself about five times already. So who knows what you'll do after you just just sell your growing. business. Just that's keep right. gro- gro- That's the whole thing, right? Yeah. Growth beyond badass. Dr. Janet Van Dyke. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. If you haven't subscribed, please hit the subscribe button and also that little bell icon next to it. That way you'll get notifications when a new episode drops. And I'd love it if you'd follow me at Inside Aspen. Inside Aspen on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And then the website's InsideAspen.com. I'm Ann Abernathy. See you next time.